Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of the Elk Talk Podcast. Normally, we do not do an introduction, but today we felt that we should for two reasons. One, our guest deserves it, uh, Charlie Decker, co-founder of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Uh, he's going to join Corey and I today, and uh, you'll see when he joins us, <laughs> He just starts talking, and uh, so I had to hurry and hit the record button. So you you might wonder, man, that was pretty abrupt. How, how did that happen? Why, why didn't they have the record button going? Well, we thought that we were going to talk about the logistics of this and how it all works, and Charlie just starts talking. I'm like, I better hit the record button. So uh, that, that's one reason why. And then the other reason is when Charlie left, uh, Someone was texting him, Charlie, you got to be at the next event. You got to be at the next event. So he just took his headset off and he laid it on the the uh, table and he pointed to me in the mouth, I got to go. And out the door he went. <laughs> so we, we didn't get a, a, a formal open and we didn't get a formal close. So uh, that's what you get with this one. But I can assure you it's going to be worth your listen. Absolutely worth your listen. He is. He is an American treasure. So thanks for being here. Welcome to the Elk Talk Podcast with Randy Newberg and Corey Jacobson. Presented by the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. The goal is what little you and I know about elk hunting, we share with people. I've got an elk building. It's like 120 yards away. What do I do? First off, the thought would never cross my mind when an elk be 120 yards away to call anybody on a cell phone. <laughs> All elk. All the time. Only elk. Only elk. Well, it's us having conversations, so we usually go down some rabbit holes. But if you hunt with Corey Jacobson, you will find the landscape is full of rabbit holes. We're just going to make this up as we go. And you look at it like, oh, that's a target-rich environment. But if you're trying to single one out, a solo target there is much easier to go into than a, a big group. We record everything, so there's no BS and no lying, no faking it with us. <laughs> Did we hit the record I button? I forgot to hit the record <laughs> button. If you want to know something about elk hunting, this probably isn't the podcast to listen to. <laughs> Should we give them a list of all the other podcasts well. where they might learn something? <laughs> No need for an intro here. But you can you can, you can cut and edit here, huh? Yeah, if, yeah. If I get out of line, if you get out of line, Charlie, we're not going to make you look bad. But we're, we want it. We <laughs> we want it to look like Charlie Decker, don't we? <laughs> Doesn't have to be pretty. Yeah, just effective. Yeah. So, folks, we are here in the house that Charlie and Bob built. Uh, I'm talking about Charlie Decker and Bob Munson uh, at the RMEF headquarters. I know you don't like it when I say that, Charlie, because you don't feel that you built it. But you you and Bob were the ones who, and let's see, you, Bob, Bob's brother, Dan? Bill. Bill. And Dan Bull. Dan Bull. Yeah. yeah. You guys started this operation yeah. in Troy, Montana in 1984. Yeah, we did. It was, uh, it was uh, a roll of the dice. It's unbelievable, but uh, it was... Yeah, it was just the four of us that were involved in a little church, and and Dan Bull and I were avid elk hunters, and, uh -huh. and Bill and Bob uh, were members of our church, and he brought back a a little pamphlet from Fanaz Foundation Foundation for North American Sheep, and and we got to talking and said, you know, there's sheep and there's ducks and and these other organizations, but you know, elk is probably one of the most magnificent creatures on in the country. And yeah. why hasn't somebody done anything for elk? And so we talked about it. And 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 Bob Munson is he's an entrepreneur or a salesman premier. You will yeah. know that he can sell uh, <laughs> freezers to Eskimos. And so uh, we kind of kicked it around and, and so I had an attorney in Spokane that had set up my logging company and we didn't know nothing about a 501 3 or C or anything so we went and met with him and 
Well, he said, no big deal. 5013C, they run too pretty good. What are you going to do? Well, we're going to start an Elk Foundation. He said, you're what? <laughs> I said, we're going to start a foundation to help the elk. <laughs> he kind of laughed. He said, okay. He said, I, as long as you pay your bill, I don't care what you want to do. <laughs> and so, in a way, why, we proceeded along, and, and there's a kind of a little side note as we're going from Troy to Pocan, which is a big city for us. And I was in Libby, Montana, and Bob and Bill and Dan were in Troy. We pick up this paper that said, it's just called the, the Neckle Trader, you know, where they yeah. put all these advertisements. And and up in the corner, or there's it says, Elk Unlimited Banquet. And we hadn't got our 5013C yet, you know. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, somebody has beat us to the punch. We've been keeping this under wraps, talking about it and strategizing all these things we're going to do and yeah. and, and get uh, uh, squared away. And so we done a little homework, and it was just a local group, and they were having a banquet and taking on the force service over closing gates. Okay. Uh, and they just had one issue in mind, but, boy, we were scared to death that we had been beat to the punch. Yeah. Until, you know, until we got the 513C, you know, we was kind of in Never Never Land. Right. And so we finally got that done up, and and now probably the next order of business is how do we market? How do we let people know who we are and what we're doing and how yeah. great we are and so on? Yeah. So we... Uh, Wrangled, I think it was the the, the non-resident hunters for Montana uh, mailing there, there's list. There's a list, yeah, yeah. And I don't, know, I shouldn't say this, but you cut it out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bob was not a hunter, uh huh. And so he's going to send out this plea, and I'll never forget it. it Says, "Congratulations on bagging your elk." last fall. Well, these are just non-resident hunters. They, they who applied. They, they had applied. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't say nothing, but in a way, why we sent out those and, and they had an auction at the Forest Service and they had this automatic lep- letter opener. You know, you put the envelope and it shoots through there, you know. Yeah. Bob picked it up for $12 because we were going to have to have that to open up all these. All this mail <laughs> you're going to get. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Well, that got never used. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so, so you didn't get inundated from that first mailing. Well, it's pretty common knowledge that we sent out. I want to say total with another list and so on, forty-two thousand uh-huh. of these brochures. My wife drew the first elk on there, and it looked like a pregnant camel, uh, <laughs> but she's not an artist. But in a way, uh, and that, and the side note on that story is, we we got that elk, and we had them in Spokane, Washington. We had them make some stickers. When you got a membership, you could put this sticker in your window. Uh-huh. The first hour of the sun come out, it turned black and peeled off. <laughs> we spent twelve hundred dollars on on these deals, and. That was a kind of a disaster. <laughs> and so... Uh, so the 42,000, how many did you end up with? The first year we had 233 members. My mother, Bill, Bob's <laughs> mother, uh, our banker... You knew all the members. <laughs> our banker uh, was my Elf Foundation member number 10, and uh, there's an interesting slide story there. We all, we figured, well, it was Dan's idea, he'll be number one. Bob was number two, and I took number three. And Bill and Bob are very competitive. Two brothers. Yeah. He took zero. (laughs) (laughs) And so, so, uh, uh, Dale Burke is member number four, and you probably remember Dale Burke. Oh, yeah. And he was so proud of that. Our banker was number 10. And his, I, you know, he's got more money than uh, the government, and he, he wouldn't. I wanted to buy, get him a buy, uh, buy a life membership. Yeah, 
He said, number 10 is my number, and I'll never change it. And I found out I wanted to – we had a local guy up there that was Elk, Ron, um, Elk Foundation member, life member number one. Uh -huh. And when he passed away, I talked to him here about buying that. Yeah, buying it back. Bu buying it back. Yeah. And they shot me down. Uh, but uh, – so he was very protective of that number, but the two two thirty three, I think, uh, was our membership, and we were broke. We started the organization. Bill and Bob borrowed eight thousand apiece, of course, from their mother. Yeah. Dan Bull had nothing. He was a preacher in our, and he was only there about ninety days, and he left. Okay. And then it was Bill, Bob, and I, and and you know the story about. Well, My eight thousand dollars. Well, yeah, you're such a big time logger, you know. You get you had money laying everywhere, Charlie. I took the last eight thousand dollars we had in my my son, oldest son's college fund to start it. <laughs> and Yvonne was all excited about yeah, that. Yeah, she was really excited and to the point that uh, she was calling the lawyer about D I V O R C E. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Randy's getting all sorts of ideas here for his marriage advice. Uh, uh, did you know what I give not marriage to do? advice? Well, at that time, I needed a lot of advice. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, it wasn't fun times, and I had just I'm in the logging business. I had just bought in the early '80s, 1980. I bought a yarder, mm -hmm. and it, the mill talked me into it. And you're probably too young to remember the early 1980s, but. I'm not. I, I remember <laughs> like 21% interest rates. <laughs> well, that, now let me get finish the story. I paid $347,000 in 1980 for what? this wow. highly yard, yarder, and I was paying 2% over prime on the payment. Charlie, that's a lot I, of... I never did say I was the sharpest tool in the drawer, but uh, <laughs> the, the mill had promised me all this work in a way. I was in trouble, uh -huh. <laughs> pretty good trouble, but uh, I did, finally dig out of that hole, but I was laid off for a certain period of time, but uh, we made it, and and I think of the six, one of the, we, we done one or two smart things in this, in this whole story, is we had some pretty good local talent, and Lance Shelvin was painting signs for the Forest Service, mm -hmm. and we hired him to put out this Bugle magazine. That's right. That's uh, that's the flagship, in my mind, of, of how we got the word out. As I traveled years later in the East, and I always ask people, "How'd you find out about the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation?" I picked up a bugle. Yep, somewhere. And it's very interesting. I had a couple of pretty good articles in there of antler growth is one that's always sticks in my mind that Gary Wolf did on the age of a bull to reach maximum that was study done on Vermejo Park. Mm -hmm. And it would, and people kind of like that. But uh, that bugle, uh, Lance put that together, and you know that story. He'd never done nothing like that. And when he used so much Scott tape, uh, that when they took it to Hart Press, when they tried to photo the flashback just made it black <laughs> uh, and they had to go to a lot of extra work to print that mag magazine uh but i forget the blazing blazing was his name i think at heart press he was just a peach to work with hmm. i mean we were greener than gourds uh, <laughs> uh doing this magazine yeah but it was one of the smart things we did uh -huh. in in hindsight and and of course there was other banquets going on, so uh, we started talking about somehow we got to get out there and raise money with the banquets and uh, the banquet system, you know. But yeah. we got to you have to try and have a better mousetrap, and so we was going to put on the best <laughs> one of the better banquets. Well, anyway, we had some friends and early members. Bob Button was in uh, Flagstaff, Arizona, and. and uh, said, we ought to try and put on a banquet. We'd contacted some of these guys. Well, uh, the one thing I'll remember is uh, we sent down one of them cheap, looked like, a, looked like a bronze, but it was just cheap, and it got wrecked in shipping, and all it was there was 
four wires where the legs were and some a bunch of powder in the bottom of the box. They auctioned it off anyway. I mean, and they had a great time. But we were trying to do things so right. Uh, and so that was our number one banquet was in Flagstaff, Arizona. But in in the spring of 85, uh, we had went to Spokane for our first convention, or yeah. national convention. Yeah. And we didn't know nothing, but we went to the Red Lion. I think it was at the Red Lion, and we, we got another really nice lady that kind of walked us through this deal. And I told Munson, I said, if we can get the top four heads, people will come. Okay. We need something to draw them. Uh, and so we uh, booked it, and then we'd made arrangements to get the top four heads. We got the Dark Canyon Bull of Flutes. In, in Colorado. In Colorado, and this number two head come off of uh, Jackson Hole out of the museum. And number three head come from Canada. Clarence Brown, who killed that bull, come down and him and his brother. And, boy, you talk about put away the booze. I mean, we, <laughs> uh, we, we run a pretty good bar bill, but we... Uh, and we had the number four head, which is a, and Randy probably disagrees with me, but the number four head's the prettiest bull elk that's ever been killed in is my that, mind. Is that Fred Mercer's bull? Yeah. Yeah. There's only like an eighth inch different from side to side, and it is absolutely a perfect head. Yeah. And Fred was the neatest guy, and he loaned us that bull. But anyway, when we had the, <laughs> the four heads, people come, and uh, that's where I met Aaron Jones, who became a very dear friend of mine. And... And uh, Wallace Pate had been out here, and uh, he had a hunt in Bob Marshall with, uh, I think it was Harry Workman out of Eureka. They, he had an outfitting deal, and, mm -hmm. and Wallace picked up a bugle and called Bob. And he was very interested, very early member, Wallace was. And, and Wallace was a, a wealthy individual. Mm -hmm. and was he from North Carolina? He's Georgetown, oh. South Carolina. South Carolina. His... his he married Lulu Vanderbilt. Mm -hmm. huh? That goes back to Vanderbilt the Railroad. Fifteen <laughs> hundreds. <laughs> yeah. He was they had a mansion down there. Do you right if I do these kinds of things? He had a mansion down there and he uh was getting termites and he was digging in a flower garden and he dug up part of a headstone, I'll never forget this, and it was dated sixteen hundred and something. Oh. In Arcadia Plantation, when I was down there, there was it was still the slave quarters and stuff on there. Uh, wow. uh, it was, and what a beautiful place! Oh, yeah. huh. and so, but that's how we got acquainted with. Probably I credit them too with being very critical in our organization because we had nothing. Yeah, and and there was a little bit of one up. Uh, a little bit of you know that's old money. This is yeah. Aaron Aaron Jones was uh, his mother was shot through a screen door and he rolled her in a rug there, eight or ten years old. Oh, and he was raised by an uncle in an orphanage kind of a situation. And every dime he made, he made yeah in the in the timber industry, in the milling industry, and so on. So, and he was in the throw biz, but. Bob and Wallace hit it off pretty well, and Aaron and I hunted together for 20-plus years mm -hmm. uh, and uh, got to be very dear friends, and they were instrumental in those early days. Yeah. And So after the Spokane deal, were you guys just flush with cash then? No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> months and we counted the money. Now, this is... As close as I can remember numbers, but we had run up a a, a bill for forty three thousand and some odd dollars, and we took in forty two thousand and some odd dollars. <laughs> and we we were talking about getting a pickup running in vehicles because we were short. We was just going to leave town, <laughs> <laughs> but it worked out. And uh, we were still bumping along, and but and. Bob took his son to to uh, Stanford, where he went to school. Jeff went to school down there, and 
and on the way, he, every every time he went by a gas or a little convenience, drop off a bundle of bugles, you know, just like a trap line all the way yeah. to Sanford. But on the way, he met Jack Ward, stopped at Starkey. Oh, okay. And went in and talked to Jack Ward Thomas mm -hmm. for advice. No. And... And the Starkey Project, are you familiar with that? Yeah. yeah. It was where they were doing a lot of studying on the, the what happens with road building, logging, and all the things in a in a situation, how elk react, and they were monitored heart rates and, and what they ate. It was it most in-depth study of elk probably going on. So it was just wise to do that. But Jack kind of got on board. And that was the other thing I'd say is, is – Folks in the business at Spokane, the the Dwight Shoes, the Larry Jones, the Jim Zumbos, the the recognizable names in the hunting industry were there. Yeah. And there again, that's a credibility thing. I mean, who heard of Charlie Decker and Bob and Bill Munson? Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> we didn't have much of a track record in the in in the big world there. So. Uh, and Jack Ward was there, yeah. the keynote speaker. I mean, so we were very fortunate that we had those kind of folks show up. And so we bumped along, but it was, the bugle was a drain because Wayne Haynes at the bank uh, was a dear friend, a good elk hunter, hard hunting banker uh, guy, and, and he kind of hid stuff from his directors and everything was kind of QT of what was going <laughs> on because we really didn't know uh, didn't know quite how things were going to fly until we got the bugle out and got it out the door and stole yeah. on and so forth and, and then I, I remember the time that in Denver I called the Iron Lady but they've been beating on her you know for somebody to distribute the magazine mm -hmm. and by gosh, they finally ordered two thousand magazines, and oh my goodness, this is this is big business. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that was really a, a a good thing in our our history. Uh, and I don't know where you want me to go from here, but uh, the second convention was Denver. Yeah, and uh, Bill's. We hadn't went to California yet. The second convention, Bill Munson was still there, and he had a baby in a stroller. And I'll never forget, Ann, his wife, was wheeling the baby, and she had a big sack, like a diaper bag, to collect the money at all our little spots around there. <laughs> and he took it to his room. You know, we're from Troy, Montana, Libby, Montana. We didn't know them motels had safes and stuff to put money in. It was stacked on Bill's bed. There was just a mound of money and credit card receipts. And I was rolling in it like Scrooge in the old comic books. You know? <laughs> and we took that money home in grocery bags and uh, sacks. Uh -huh. It was, I want to remember, $219,000. Oh, wow. And I met some other people there that come onto the board later and so on. And and they spent a lot of money and... Uh, one of them had, was in some tax situation, and he got to be a dear friend later. And he never shared this story for about thirty years. But his accountant told him they were going there and they're going to buy hunts and do all this stuff. And he said, "You can spend uh, around seventy thousand, seventy-seven thousand." <laughs> when he got home, his accountant said, "I had to adjust that." He said, "You could only spend thirty. <laughs> <laughs> so that's world. I'm, accountants aren't the smartest tools in the shed. So. Hey now, <laughs> but <clears throat> I, I really, in my mind, think Denver, and we were two and a half years old, mm -hmm. that we might have a chance hmm. uh, of making it. Yeah, and it's been a lot of peaks and valleys, uh, but I would say this. In hindsight, which is always twenty twenty, we always had something happen at the eleventh hour to keep the thing going. And I'm a strong believer that there's a good Lord up above 
that had his hand in this thing. And if unless you've lived my life, you probably maybe question that. But it, uh, Bob Munson, without a doubt, was a salesman, salesman supreme. Yeah. And he could remember stuff about people and a little something about them on the early days that we'd show up sh and shaking hands and stuff. I, I I might shake down and forget him, but he'd always remember a little something about them and and remember him by name. He had a real gift that way. Uh -huh. and, uh, and he was the right guy at the right time. Yeah. And, and then uh, some of the things we did were miracles. And you all know the story of Rob Creek. and We do, but our audience doesn't. So Rob Creek is an amazing piece of property here oh, in Montana. Rob Creek is an amazing piece of property. And so uh, we were courting Anheuser-Busch, uh, but they got to go through all the hoops. But we were down to the 11th hour, and we had to have a million bucks. And we couldn't rub two nickels together at home. <laughs> And we had another guy that I will I'll insert here that I think played a big role in the organization was Phil Tawney. Phil Tawney was our first attorney. He had some good contacts, uh, and Otto Teller and Leonard Sarge were a couple of his contacts that were wealthy individuals. And and so through him and uh, and Wallace and Tawney's buddies, they loaned us a million dollars to hold that property because the state of Montana had to go. They ha they were going to said uh, the director at the time was, uh, his name escapes me, but called and they had to go through the legislative process to get the, it was actually a $2 million deal. We had to have a million up front. And uh, so we, Wallace sent us 500000 and Sergeant and Teller give us two fifty a piece. Well, the way the state and all government works, why they were a little slow about coming around, and and I, I don't remember if it was Teller or Sergeant, but they had something company. They need their two fifty back. Wallace wired us another two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, so wow. uh, we were still in the game. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what year was that, Charlie? I want to say eighty eight. Yeah. But okay. asking me dates, I might be... Well, um, plus or minus. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And in fact, the neat thing is, and I went back there and we did some encroachment on some stuff in that area. It is a, that place is worth $30,000 an acre to subdivide yeah. in a heartbeat. Easy, yeah. And it was really heartwarming for me to see that we saved that Rob Crick. Yeah. Uh, Drainage and there was about two hundred head elk on there, and there was four or five thousand head elk in there. Yeah. And the other thing, Tawny had a real good deal, is and it put us on the map a little bit. Is the migration corridor from northern Yellowstone to Dome Mountain? Yeah. Uh, we had a I had a dear friend. He wasn't a dear friend at the time, but he became a dear friend. And Bob Gibson and mm -hmm. and Barbie was a superintendent at the park. Then we got the corridor for those elk to move from. North Yellowstone to Up Dole Mountain to, Dole to winter. Mountain. Right. And so we were gaining some credibility and maybe a reputation a little bit. But uh, it still bumps in the road, yeah. you know. Yeah. And Well, you know, talking about uh, right people at the right time, could there have been a more right person than Bob Gibson at that time? Probably not. I mean, supervisor of the forest, and he, he, he was fanatic he, elk hunter. Fanatic elk hunter. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, he had the largest collection of immature animals I ever seen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> An interesting thing, and your viewer or listeners might be interested, and in something that I wish, I think everybody wished he'd do, but in 1949. He kept a day a, a log of every hunting and fishing trip he ever took with some notes in it. In yeah. fact, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, because he fished the Madison so much, they come to him for data on what the catch rate <laughs> <laughs> was down there. But and we've got him at the oak farm. Uh, there's a halfway filled this room. Yeah, 
Wow. Of what, but it, it was an amazing thing. He's an amazing guy. Him and I were mm-hmm. probably the best two turkey hunters. I, I, don't, I don't like to throw my name out there. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> Corey and I joke and laugh about turkey hunters. And that's why you and Gibby are such good turkey hunters. You guys fit the mold. <laughs> you know, turkey hunting, if, if you'd get off your duff, you'd find out that turkey hunters... Turkey hunting's just like elk hunting? Replicate, are you going to say that? Yeah, uh, replicate, no. <laughs> uh, replicate uh, elk hunting. Oh. And I can guarantee you one thing. If a turkey could smell like an elk, you would never kill a turkey. Because his eyesight and his hearing... Are better than any elk you've ever seen. Yeah. Well, there are all these stories about you and Gibby. <laughs> oh, no. Well, I, 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 we, we don't have enough time to go there. Well, you know, <laughs> before Bob passed, he invited me over to his house. Oh, he did. And we interviewed him for three hours going through those journals and the number of Charlie Decker stories. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I need to break those out. Actually, Marcus, who works for me, we we are pulling that out, and we're going to try to do something for about Gibby. And the reason is, there's all these people along the way. Bob didn't want any, you know, notoriety. No. He he just was in a position at the Forest Service in the most critical elk migration corridor, and he was an elk hunter. And before he retired, he said he told me, "It's like we were going to get that done. If I lost my job, we were still going to get that done." Well, yeah. and you guys helped him. Yeah, or he helped you guys. Yeah, I mean it was, and that you're exactly right, Randy. It's the people. As I look back, you know, uh, it was just meant to happen. The timing was good, and I think what we saw, particularly I saw, was the development when you have land rich people that settled the best ground coming west, and they're cash poor, and when this they pass on there's a tax consequences and stuff that they are they're forced to sell it to sell it to some developer or something and growing up in my country the elk migrated a pretty good way from winter to summer and i knew even as a young man uh you got to have winter ground we're finding out now that of course summer's just as important as winter and so on but as a as a young man it was winter ground and the statement Jack Ward Thomas that I've quoted several times when we started, he said, focus on habitat, concentrate on habitat, you won't get yourselves into trouble. You start getting in, taking sides on whatever, whatever, you, excuse me, you split your membership, you got, and then you, you're in the battle. It's so, uh, and we've made mistakes. And you learn from mistakes. Yeah. Uh, example, sitting on the wolf issue too long. We wouldn't take a stand. Yeah. Uh, but, and what has happened, I think, and I might be prejudiced a little bit, not bad, but a little bit. We have stayed transparent. We have kept our word. Mm-hmm. We have done what we say we're going to do. And, and our credibility as an organization, in my opinion, is unparalleled in conservation. Uh, but I might have somebody disagree with me, but look what you've done. I, I look at the other, and I'm not running, I mean, we all do good work. We all have the same cause. Mm-hmm. But you look at what we've done, and uh, it's not peanuts anymore. No. It's big time stuff. Yeah. And uh, the relocation of elk, and there again, timing. Yeah, you won't Tom never have it'll never happen again like we did that. No, and we hit that window in the late nineties before chronic wasting disease come to the forefront that was really known, and uh, got in under the wire, and there's going to be elk all over the east. In 50 years, right. where there's habitat, I think. Mm-hmm. You can't, they don't have the predator control. You know, an interesting fact that uh, on the commission, we had a lot of elk in that northern Yellowstone herd and killing a lot of cows and so on and so forth. Uh, 
but I can remember some figures like if you could get 20 cows per 100 cows, you're maintaining or yeah. something to that number. Yeah. And But when you drop down to 12 or 14 white, you're losing ground. And I seen something out of Kentucky a couple of years ago that 94 calves out of 100 cows reached their first birthday. <laughs> now you tell me you ain't going to have elk. Yeah. yeah. And so... Um, that was, in my mind, that was a real milestone in the organization's history of, uh, it gives me goosebumps to think about yeah. because it's something, we were talking at lunch, you know, uh, they found a horn. Did you read that story about finding that horn with D. Boone in a barn in Kentucky? No. Well, it was in the bugle, and I asked the other day, and Blake Kenning said that they've done the carbon thing and so on. And they, they actually think it was legit his. Wow. Because <laughs> I wonder if they verified it. Yeah. But, uh, and, and according to, you have to ask Blake, but. Uh, so was this an elk antler? Yeah. Wow. The, that, the first the first shed antler collector. Man, sorry. no kidding. Daniel Boone. Whew. We thought he was just an elk hunter. Imagine what that'll go for at auction. <laughs> well, I, you know, it, it was picked up in a barn here in the last, uh, huh. an old barn down there where he lived. Wow. Because you think about Kentucky, I don't know if, uh, you know, when I was growing up, if you would have told me there'd be 14,000 elk in Kentucky, <laughs> I'd have thought you were smoking something. Yeah. I, I would have never dreamed that. And I, I remember as an RMEF member and volunteer, kind of having some questions in my head about who's cooking up this <laughs> idea. Kentucky? We're going we're, we're gonna to spend money to put elk in Kentucky? Well, again... Right time, right person, right time, right place, right? Yeah, we had a, we had a guy on the board, uh, Tom, Tom, Baker. Baker, Tom Baker was on the commission. In, 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 in Kentucky. In Kentucky, yeah. and, and he, he was pushing hard. <laughs> yeah, he, was, <laughs> really he doesn't pushing take hard. a no for an answer. <laughs> and so, but I mean, that's been the seed source for the other states. And you, you look at that kid that killed that Virginia bull. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> last year yeah and i i tell folks in the in our organization i've raised cattle a lot of years and so on and there's a reason for crossbred vigor and when you take elk from here 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 and here you're introducing that genetic diversification that's going to produce a real Stud, one of these yeah. days. <laughs> well, they got him in Virginia, that yeah. guy. He what did. was he, 420 four something? 432, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. Yep. Yeah. So. And you just look at the elk back east. I mean, Kentucky, Pennsylvania, Virginia, they're all, like you said, they're genetically different than what we have out here. Yeah. yeah. They're big. Yeah. <laughs> and so I don't. <laughs> Forty years has went pretty quick, Randy. Yeah. But it's, and I will so just insert this. Uh, as late as two thousand eight, when we went in a recession, and was you on the board when we had the November surprise? Nope. You heard about it. Yep, I heard about it. In fact, I, it was one of the reasons when you guys asked me to be on the board. I'm like, well, I got to go and look back at some history here. <laughs> but but we was. Uh, we just was in debt pretty bad. Bank wasn't, I mean, we, it was a recession. It was tough times. Yeah. And the hiring of David Allen, there again, was the right guy at the right time. Yeah. And we went from $16 million in debt to today. Them numbers are so big, I can't even read them. <laughs> <laughs> but now, I you know, I feel so good that that I know it's going to make it now. Mm -hmm. We uh, And I'm not, maybe I'm bragging a little bit, <laughs> but uh, we have the best staff, and particularly senior staff in the country, yeah. in an organization like this. I, mm -hmm. You'll have to have a hard time convincing me any better and through the years we i don't think another organization has had the dedication and the passion and the stick to itness of this organization yeah 
thick and thin they're there. And you add up the dollars worth of projects that they have done in guzzlers and fence pulls and taken up stuff, yeah. they've done millions and millions of dollars worth of work. Yeah. And and they love it. Yeah. And so I just, uh, and they just stay. I mean, I'd get, I'd they're retire after forever. A while. Huh? Yeah. They, they, you look at the longevity <laughs> of the employees here. They've been here, you know, 25, 30 years. And they love it. Yeah. You don't see that today. You, you know, you, 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 well, it's, it's something I think that we all, when I look at my work and when I look at my kids and what they're going to, going to be doing, it all comes down to passion. I mean, if you're going to stick with something a long time, you've got to be passionate about it or you're going to burn out, you're going to leave. And I think for so many of us with elk, especially, there's a there's a dream there. There's a it's not just I want to go shoot an elk. It's I want elk to be here. I want there to be a legacy. Yeah. And I I don't think you get that necessarily. I mean, maybe like with trout, you know, the trout people they they kind of see it the same way there, but it's not the same. There's just something about elk that that just lights a fire in us and and ignites a passion there. And I think that that's what's cool about an organization like this is it attracts those people, and then those people don't ever leave. Well, it, yeah. it's interesting. Last night on the States, and how many, I mean, I'd been back to a uh, banquet in Maine, and the first people I met, do you remember me? I said, well, wh where are you from? Maine. I said, what? I had been back to Maine to a banquet. I've been to, I don't know how many oh, states and how many banquets I've been to. Hundreds and hundreds of them. <laughs> and, but there's Ohio. There's, there's so many non-elk states, volunteers here, it just boggles my mind. Yeah. You'd think it would just be wherever the elk are. That's the only people. That's not the case at all. No. I mean, last night was volunteer fun night. Uh because we're here at, in Missoula at headquarters celebrating the 40th anniversary of when you and Bob and Bill and Dan got this crazy idea. And last night, you look at those volunteers, how excited they were, how energetic they were. And when we put the maps up of every state, Florida, 50-some thousand dollars <laughs> yeah. raised, Vermont, uh, Maryland, Delaware, Connecticut. It, it, yeah. There's no elk in those states. <laughs> Alabama, Mrs. We put them all up there. It's crazy. It is. But they love elk. Yeah. And they, 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 I think a point that you say, Charlie, of you guys always said, you're, if you said you're going to do it, you did it. You kept your word. And I think that is just something people want to be a part of. Uh, I mean, yeah, elk. They want to help with all that. But they know and they trust. Well, yeah. But, you guys have laid the foundation where the ethos here is if we say we're going to do it, we're going to do it. Yeah. So it, it's, it's, a, it's an amazing story. I've, I've heard so many of these sidebars from you. A lot of people don't know, Charlie. How long did you serve on the Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Commission? Eight years. Eight years. Governor Roscoe appointed yes. you, me. So my first introduction to Charlie <laughs> was when he was on that commission and I was a wet behind the ears accountant who had just taken a $25,000 pay cut to move to Montana. So my, my resident elk tag wasn't costing me. My wife reminded me that's not a $12,000 or a $12 elk tag for you. <laughs> that's a $25,000 elk tag, Randy. So you better, better get active. And so Charlie and I had a lot of colorful conversations when he was on the commission but, but you you did your homework yeah that's and, the and you was a, you was a you was a what would you say i wouldn't say adversary but uh <laughs> not a very bright individual <laughs> uh, <laughs> the, the thing that i remember most about that is you were bound to determine to get sheep in the green mountains and they well cory appreciate this story this family had been here since 1392, before, <laughs> before uh, Columbus. Before Columbus, <laughs> and they'd been moving sheep across from their ranch, moving across the Green Mountains. Of course, Randy didn't know that domestic sheep and bighorn sheep don't really. They're, they're such a social animal. If one of them gets disease, they're all sick. Yeah. 
I had to explain all that, set Randy down and try and <laughs> educate him in in some management of wildlife. Of course, I'm a, and the nice thing is I was a decision maker. <laughs> he was. <laughs> no, yeah. I, and we didn't move, put sheep in the greens, but uh, hmm? the interesting thing about those, I don't want to get on to sheep, but uh, we have the oldest sheep herd in Montana where I live. Hmm? But over the years, when you reintroduce sheep, they do just this way. And so we was at the fish and game. We're always trying to hold a spot. Like Rock Creek fizzled, mm -hmm. yeah. Paradise fizzled, yeah. and now it's the brakes. And All the right. brakes will fizzle, <clears throat> and you better have another place to take them. Mm -hmm. And maybe them guys aren't moving sheep anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> but there was an awful lot of those things where you and I would, would talk. Yeah. You, you'd take my calls. Uh, you know, I ne I would I returned every call. Mm -hmm. He would take your calls because there wasn't caller ID back well, then. Well, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> well, Yvonne would answer, and I'd be a Mr. Decker there. No, you wouldn't. <laughs> okay, I'd say Charlie there, but uh, no, it, it was it, it was watching you in action on that commission, Charlie was just a further extension of how you and, and the founders of Army F operated. You didn't really care if someone's feelings got hurt. You were all about the wildlife. You're, yeah. you're all about the future of hunting, the, f the future of a lot of things. And I watched you guys have to make some decisions that probably weren't any fun, but you guys accepted that and you did it. Well, uh, Talking to FWP people, they thought it was a good commission. Mm -hmm. no. You could never guess who was going to vote what. I mean, we yeah. fared it out, and mm -hmm. and I thought it was a group, good, good group of guys. Yeah, and Darlene, and one one woman. Yeah, yeah. No, you you guys did good stuff. So that anyone wondering how Charlie and I have this long history, and I've heard all these stories. I think the uh, first commission meeting I attended, you were there, was 1993, I think, yeah. somewhere in there. Yeah. And then you and I served on the bonus and preference point committee together. <laughs> <laughs> Charlie, you threatened to throw me out a couple times there with some of my crazy ideas, but you've forgiven me for most of my past yeah. sins. Well, yeah, I have. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I forgive if I'm wrong, which I have, <laughs> that don't happen very often. But. <laughs> Uh, but it's been a long run, and, and I, I can't thank you enough what you've done for the Elk Foundation. Uh, it's it's been great, uh, huh? and it's going to go down. Randy is making a difference. We're going to leave a footprint on this country. Yeah, no, that's why Corey and I are. We, you know, with this Elk Talk podcast, we tell everybody if if even if you want to reflect in the mirror of what beneficial for you personally. Supporting the Elk Foundation as an elk hunter, there, there is no organization, and I belong to all of them. I'm a life member in every one of them. There's no organization that has done more for the things that are important to me, my life, my family, my relationships, my friendships with guys like Corey than the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. Not The, the next group, I, and this, like you said, it's not a criticism of the other groups. It's how far ahead the Elk Foundation is in the things that are important to me. And that's why we, <laughs> people might get tired of me and that's Corey saying, if you aren't a member of the Elk Foundation, just quit listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and that's, that's just, I mean, I, I don't get quite that uh, aggressive in my stance on it, but <laughs> I would love to hear the reason why. You know, if somebody has a, a valid reason, and I haven't heard one yet, you yeah. know, I hear Charlie brought up the wolf thing, and mm -hmm. that was a big thing for a while. Right. You know, not taking a stance on the wolves was, it, it hurt a lot of people's feelings that, hey, we're trying to protect elk, and the Elk Foundation isn't getting behind this. Right. But then they corrected course, and now there are still people out there that say they didn't make a decision on the wolves. And I'm, you can't look at them now. They're at the forefront of fighting. I just signed something that's, you know, the Elk Foundation is involved right now in litigation for making sure that the wolves don't get delisted. Or the listed. only reason, in my mind, the only reason we are even hunting elk 
or hunting wolves in Montana was the Elk Foundation, yeah. right? went to bat. But the other thing we did is we based stuff on science, and, we, and there ain't nobody has put the money into studying predator-prey relation and, and on the wolves than the Elk Foundation. Right. Yep. But we, we published that, uh, that... We're going to try and make do have the best science available to make the best decision we can, not to appease people, but to protect the wildlife. And that's that's the hardest part. Is you're never going to please everyone. No, you're not. But if you do what's best for wildlife, it's hard to argue with that. Well, it's hard to tell people it all needs to be managed. Yeah, that's that's the key. Is <clears throat> you've got to manage. And it's the same thing in my business. You got to manage the forest. One of these days, Montana and my country and, and all these other places are learning. Fire will take care of it for you. Yeah. In their fashion, it ain't so pretty then. No. And it's the same with wildlife. Nature can manage itself, but it's not going to be very pretty That's when it right. does it. Yeah. Well, you're, you know, the three of us all come from logging backgrounds, so the audience might think we're we're biased in that feeling, <laughs> but. You're you're absolutely right, Charlie. I mean, I always tell people, you either tell your story or someone's going to tell your story for you, yeah. and you won't like the outcome. Same with managing wildlife or or, or forests. Yeah, like you both said. Well, it, it might get managed, but it's not going to be the management you you want. want. That's yeah. right, and yeah. it's not a management; it's a result. Yeah, and it's not <laughs> the result you want. It's, it's yeah. that guy upstairs. Doing his job that you're not doing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I mean we, we've we've encroached in areas. You know, you talk about corridors and different things. Just as a society and development, we've done damage, and now our responsibility is to be stewards of that land, whether it's the wildlife, the habitat, and if we aren't, it's not managed, and the result is not going to be. I think even the people who don't agree with hunting have the same vision for the result. They just have a different way of wanting to get there that I think science has proven isn't going to work. And I, you know, I, one of the questions I had for you was in 1983, 1984, did you see today? Did I see today? Yeah. yeah. Did you see where hunting was going? Did you see where wildlife, where elk were going? Was it more of just a passion for elk then? Or did you see what was going to happen? I think I... I thought the the losing of the of the winter range and critical ground and subdivision was an enemy that was encroaching and and taking away the best groceries. It, I mean, I've hunted, uh, I've killed a lot of elk, and I've hunted hard my whole life. And in my country, winter range is really important. Yeah, we don't have a lot of south slope to bear up. At, you know, they got a tough end. We get a lot of snow up there, and and so I'm pretty local. With uh, I didn't have much of the big picture to say, uh, but uh, I got educated pretty quickly. And you know, I've I've had uh, conservation easements. I had a guy as big as as big as a buffalo, and I think in Canyon City, Colorado, we bought a conservation need. He could have whipped any grizzly bear in the world with a switch. <laughs> <laughs> and he come up and grabbed a hold of me, and I thought I was in the grasp of a grizzly bear, <laughs> and give me a hug. And the tears are coming down because we put a conservation easement on it and saved his place. And that's worth everything I ever did. Huh. That's cool. That's meaningful. It's just amazing that, you know, when I think of doing some, when you look at what the Elk Foundation represents now and what it does across the whole country, across all these different landscapes, to think that the vision for that came from Troy and Libby, Montana. Because like you said, that vision, you, you had a very small window of what you saw. Yeah, and I did. that's not a place that's hugely impacted by subdivisions. I mean, it's still a smaller place. No, it but, isn't. Not. But all it takes is one subdivision in the wrong place to impact that entire herd of elk and the entire elk population in there. So you take that vision, that very uh, micro vision, and put that on a macro scale, and that's what that's what change is about. And to go from that small setting with that one, this is my elk herd, I want to protect my elk herd, and not only have you protected elk 
across 50 states, there are now more elk. And it's amazing to me to think of where that started, where it is today, and then to try to envision 40 years from now where it's going to be. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Charlie, I, I went back and looked at the numbers. When you guys started, there were less than 600,000 elk in North America. Yeah. And the numbers weren't climbing. No. They were, in most places, they were flat or shrinking. Yeah. Now we got over one point one million. Did, could you have no. imagined that no. forty years ago? No, no, no. I, I mean, you think about that. It's, <laughs> you know, they, they say you climb a mountain one step at a time, right? And then that's kind of what you guys did. It wasn't it. It wasn't a marked trail <laughs> out to get up that mountain. No, and, <clears throat> and it's pretty easy to tumble, stumble, and trip, and fall a little bit, oh. and have to pick yourself up and regain some some elevation but you guys did it yeah 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 it's uh it's an amazing story for sure yeah did you ever have when the four of you and maybe some others were sitting around the feeling of well if I, <clears throat> if not us who yeah well we got real nervous when we thought somebody else was going off <laughs> <tell you> that. <laughs> <clears throat> so when you guys went home with this idea and said we each need to cough up eight thousand dollars, how'd that go over? Well, my wife didn't find out about it for a little while. <laughs> <laughs> marriage advice number two. Uh, that's marriage <laughs> advice number two. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> point of me asking that is, I always say that conservation is always difficult. It's always uncomfortable because someone's going to be upset with you, and it's always inconvenient. And you guys just kind of said, "Yeah, we don't care. This this means something to us. This is this is why we live where we live and why we live the life we do." And yeah. you were undeterred. I mean, you had every reason to say, "Hell with this. Let's well, fold I can the tell tent." You, uh, the first year, we had some serious talks about, you know, we got two hundred and thirty-three members. <laughs> But we ain't got enough money to send to pay their membership. We're either going to forge ahead, or we're going to die trying. And I mean, uh, it, it's just not. I just couldn't take somebody's money unless I sunk with them. Mm -hmm. I guess I'd what I'd say. I value my word, and mm -hmm. and I just uh, I could apologize and say he made a mistake, but. Unless I was plumb out of any chance of, uh, I, I wouldn't, I would, shouldn't do it. Yeah. Well, they also say that organizations are usually a representation of their founders and their their leadership. Uh, well, I don't know about, boy, I, uh, <laughs> well, the apple didn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> and uh, I was gonna, I was gonna make a comment that. There but is... I can tell you, I fought that kid. <laughs> don't go to work there. You're, you're talking about your son, Steve. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's gonna live under that shadow. Mm -hmm. Don't do it. Yeah. He's so much better than me. I mean, he he's earned his stripes, and you'll probably mm -hmm. figure that out. But uh, I remember when he lived in Belgrade, and he was the regional director. Yeah, he for started our committee. at the, he started at the visitor center and went to Canada. I said, "Get him out of the country." <laughs> yeah. uh, and then something opened up in South Dakota, and here he come back. Yeah. And then they wanted to bring him to headquarters. I said, "Send him down the road somewhere," and I said. Screws up, can him. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I, yeah. I don't want to spend more spending this time, but he's blossomed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's one of If his... you want to know something about this outfit, he'll tell you. Yeah. No, he he has started, uh, you know, the old, you know, Sam Walton talking about, you know, I used to clean the bathrooms in this store. Yep. You know, he, and then, then he built Walmart. Well, you and Steve, I mean, Steve has started from the lowest of the positions. Yeah, he here. started at the very Where, bottom. And took the worst, the jobs no one else wanted, you know? Who wants to go to Canada? Who, who, who wants to go try to build chapters in South Dakota where they only have 2,000 elk? Hmm? He did. But it's it, all of these things that, I, as I see, uh, you know, 
being somewhat of an insider and somewhat of an outsider when I try to look at it from the outside. The Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation has its ethos and its way of doing business has the Charlie, Bob, Bill, and Dan thumbprint all over it. You may not think that, <laughs> but I sat in some board meetings with you, Charlie, where you would slam your fist down on the table, and usually it was, this is the not, this is how we're going to run this outfit. <laughs> and everybody paid attention. <laughs> Well, <laughs> your memory's better than mine. <laughs> no, okay, maybe it is, but <clears throat> it was, uh, you know, I mean, one of the things we, we skipped over was uh, the November surprise. You brought it up, but people are going to be wondering. 2008. What, what's that? 2008, November? Yeah, the November surprise of 2008. 2008. Uh, we had a credit, line of credit at our bank here in Missoula for $6 million dollars. Our CEO went and borrowed another two million dollars without consulting the board, and uh, in November we found out about it. Now we're broke. The bank says you're not getting another dime out of us, and we've got obligations in December. We we think uh, uh, we never did a very good job ever. Uh, I'll back up a little bit. Our banquets were in the spring. Mm -hmm. Well, there's 12 months in a year. <laughs> yeah. Geez, we're going banquets are going great guns. June, July, we're, ooh, we're really pouring it on. Well, no banquets in hunting season. August is terrible. We still got payroll, lights, all this stuff. Yeah. But they weren't, I shouldn't say they weren't smart enough, but they, they felt pretty flush. Well, then come to November and December, still payroll, still light, still heat, yeah. no money in the bank. We got to living on a line of credit. Oh, we can borrow six million bucks. Yeah. Well, you got to pay that back. And you're in accounting. Do you know that uh, when you borrow money, Randy, you got to pay it back? Yeah. <laughs> if you want to be around. Yeah. So. <clears throat> what happened in November? When you say the well, we was looking for a new CEO, but we had to uh, we had to limp along, and I think we had some behind the scenes things going on. I don't know for sure. <coughs> Excuse me, but I think that uh, we made it. In January, the banquet started, and things were going good, but. When David Allen, we don't we don't spend it and don't do it if we don't have the money. Yeah, we have a a unique system. I don't want to take much time. We have a new, unique system that we devised that I think is was really smart. Uh, what we call the PAC, where you raise money in this state or that state, you as volunteers sit on a board and you right. get to decide where some of that money's spent. That's just right. smart business. Right. If that, they're going to work that hard, they ought to have a say where some of that money's going. <clears throat> right, and PAC means Project Advisory Committee. Project not, Advisory not Committee. Not Political Action Committee. No, <laughs> Project <laughs> Advisory Committee. They, they, they looked at projects and, and funded projects, and they had a pot of money. And now in Montana, it's, it's significant that Every they state, get to yeah. distribute out for kids' pro or anything yeah. that they... You put in a, you submit a request, trap shooters, anything, and, and we dole out a couple hundred thousand dollars to those. We like to look at youth and some of the younger things, but, uh, uh, you know, that, that that's the volunteers' money to put out there. And that's another thing that I thought was pretty smart on our part to put that in. They have to have buy-in. Right. And so... <clears throat> When it was you and your family st stuffing bugle magazines in envelopes and hauling them in the wapiti wagon, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get to the wapiti wagon story here in a second. But did you ever think this group would have twelve, thirteen thousand of amazing volunteers? No, no. Uh, they had two hundred thirty-three members. Two hundred thirty. Yeah. Now they have two hundred thirty-three thousand. Yeah, volunteers. Well, yeah, members. Members. But but just. 
yeah. so many more volunteers, which, you know, there's a differentiation there. The volunteers are members too, but right. the volunteers yep. are taking time mm-hmm. and being a part of it. And I think that's a, a big thing uh, to differentiate and just say, it, right. it's one thing if everybody needs to be a member. Right. Once you're a member, what can you give? Yeah. You know, the $35, $40 a year, that's helpful. Yeah. That's important. But the volunteers, the ones that are on the ground doing things, that's the next step. So if you're a member, become a volunteer. Yeah. Whether it's at a banquet, whether it's out on a project, just be a part of, of an organization. Yeah, we got people. We have some of the projects that people drive 500 miles to go to. If we have like a calf capture where they're tagging calves, then people will drive forever to get in to handle a calf yep. yeah. or do something. And uh, They want to get their hands dirty, too. Yeah. I mean, there's some neat projects they do. Oh, that unbelievable! Uh, I mean, the fence pulls, the you know, your thinning projects. Uh, you know, the the list of projects people can do and go and help with if they get a hold of their state coordinators. It's like you could spend your whole summer volunteering on projects. If well, I'll tell to. you about a project. Uh, they in Tucson, Arizona, mm-hmm. right up by the Grand Canyon. They have they recycle or do something with the sewage. The volunteers dug a 13-mile pipeline through lava rock and put it in a concrete bunker. And I went and visited that. And you look at the tracks around that little patch of water, but the kicker was there was a frog. It had to have humped 14 miles across the desert to get there. Some bird must have picked it up and (laughs) thrown it in there. I don't know what happened. (laughs) But... The chirping of the birds and everything that went on around just the size of this room, water that those volunteers yeah. got up there. Yeah. By, by doing all that hard work. And yeah. now that becomes habitat once it has water. Once there's water, you got, you got, and we talk about the other wildlife. I mean, there's elk there, but there's, there's a zillion other things going on, bird, the birds and the chirping and the, and the, Insects. I mean, they all have to have a little drink. Yeah. No, it's that. That's the beauty of of all the things that you guys have done. When you you don't conserve and improve, what is it? Almost ten million acres of habitat now. Winter yeah. range and summer range and transition range, and you don't add another one point three million of new and improved public access. You don't do those things without a lot of amazing volunteers. No. And a lot of, you know, generous companies and generous donors and members. I mean, it it's that whole package. It takes everything. Yeah, yeah. it takes all of that. And, and we try and, and I would say we, we, people don't like to do surveys, but we survey our our membership and advocacy is one of the biggest things. Mm-hmm. They need a voice out there, like you say, access. And it's pretty discouraging to come out here from the east, drive for miles, and can't find a place to hunt. Right. And I tell the Red Hill story <clears throat> all the time. Yeah. And that story is a. Uh, yeah. That's a great story. That's a great story. It's a piece of uh, Montana that. Tons of elk, but no access. Yeah. And uh, there was a person who wanted to sell 40 acres that touched the county road, wanted to sell it to the Elk Foundation. And that 40 acres is what kept the public from getting from the county road to Lewis and Clark National Forest. And it opened up. 19,000 or something acres. Yeah. yeah. Through buying 40 acres. Yeah. Yeah. And there were some people who were disappointed because, you know, they had their own kind of privilege. They had their own access. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And here comes Elk Foundation and says, you know what? We're going to do this. We're going to open up 19 or 20,000 acres of new access that was virtually impossible to access. And, you know, that was in 2013. I'd just come on the board when that yeah. would happen, somewhere in there. But, yeah. I mean, you guys have done tons of those, Charlie. Yeah, it's just not one. Yeah. There's lots of them. Yeah. So. Well, I want to hear a story about a Wapiti wagon. Oh. Oh, that. <laughs> what was the Wapiti wagon, Charlie? I said that. I was that. talking to Risa, and she's off. She's off. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I said anything. <laughs> <laughs> you, said, you said three things that I saw 
that will become projects in the next week. I promise you. Mm. There are three new projects that are already churning in Reza's mind. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh I, I, was, I wasn't in the meeting. So no, it's it a, was you. Reza is the director of marketing. It oh, was you were there. Corey yeah, I was, I was and in the Charlie. Doorway. Reza and Ashley. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I didn't. What What are these three things? I wasn't well, in the, the meeting. The Wapiti wagon. When Charlie brought that up, that you know everybody's ears perked up. But tell the story of the Wapiti wagon. Oh, the Wapiti wagon. Didn't I already tell you? You no. told me, but yeah, not. You didn't tell me. Oh, Wallace Pate had like into the Bob Marshall. Well, he had this station wagon when he got to Montana. Why well, he'd have something to drive around. Yeah. And then he'd park it at headquarters and and go hunting, and, and he just left it here. Okay. So when he was gone, why, we'd get a shipment of bugles. You know, I come in a semi. And yeah, mag a, magazines by the bundle. Yeah, and so now you got to sack them up and put them in a folder and address them and all that stuff. And so... <laughs> and you're doing this by hand. You're yeah, putting all magazines by hand. in an envelope by hand, putting and a label on them. <laughs> luggage racks on top. We had stacks of bugles <laughs> rounded up and in the back and all around. Mm -hmm. All the high school kids, because they had to pack them, they were hanging on the sides of the bugle. And to go down Highway 2 in Troy, and here comes the Wapiti Wagon. All them high school kids and all them bugles were headed for the post office. And the post office wasn't happy when we started unloading, <laughs> <laughs> unloading the bugles. Uh, <laughs> Because they're uh, hand sorting every magazine back then, I'd imagine. They're they're pulling well, yeah. each one out, looking at the address and putting it in a box and Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever happened to the Wapiti Wagon? Wallace I, I think no, I I don't know what happened to it. It was barely running when we had it. I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean the Was it was it like the ones with the, the wood looking wood panel paneling? On no, the side? it wasn't. It was like a big old Buick or a it wasn't a Cadillac. It was a big old heavy yeah. Oldsmobile uh, or something. And it, it was kind of a pukey brown color. Yeah. Uh, huh? uh, but I'd seen it flash through one of them last night. I think i seen the Wapiti Wagon in, in one, one of, of them slides quick last fields. night. And so Reza, Reza's <laughs> going through all the that's, power and trying to find the Wapiti Wagon. That's oh, project okay. number one. Number I wouldn't one. be surprised if we don't have a Wapiti Wagon that gets auctioned off at some point in the future. <laughs> yeah, I think we need to find a Wapiti <laughs> Wagon. Yeah. yeah. Uh, What's number two? Uh, the original logo. Story of the original logo. Oh, so man. the original logo, if you'll remember, is just the round circle. It says yeah. Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, right. and it's got the elk yeah. in the middle. Them ones that all the people are wearing. Right. Yeah. yeah, I got one today. Well, we we got last got the idea off of the Great Northern logo, which was a, a, a mountain goat. goat. Yeah, on the railroad. And we... Yeah. we, we didn't know he'd get in trouble for, but that was <laughs> for stealing a logo. <laughs> stealing a logo, but the elk is not a goat. But uh, uh, that, and we had a battle at the board level. That's before your time, because uh -huh. things were starting to change. And I got to say, starting something like this, you have a little more ownership in it than probably to somebody to oh, just yeah. come on board. Yeah. And they kept telling me this logo was too busy for marketing. Huh. And then they come out with Bucky the Bull, that bull that's third back and his yeah. teeth hung out. And I said, well, Bucky the Bull do not look too good. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, there was a battle. But it is our corporate seal and our right. official corporate logo. Yep. I, I hammered that home. Uh, and the reason for that, that, that you wanted to keep that, was what? Why did you, why did you want to make sure that that original logo stayed apart? Why? Yeah. Because it was one thing that uh, we started with it to have took away. Yep. Okay. You know, oh. And I think that was the, the cool part of that story is the logo's changed. The yeah. colors have changed. The people have changed. But that original logo is still the seal of the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. And that, I would be hard-pressed to guess that that's ever going to change. Well, if, uh, if I'm breathing, yeah. <laughs> it will be hard for us. <laughs> <laughs> so that was project, or, uh, yeah, project number two. Number three you mentioned was Bucky the Bull. Right. I, w I would be, uh, I'd be surprised if Bucky the Bull doesn't make a reemergence <laughs> at some point in some fashion. You, you think we're going to sell some T-shirts or something? I, I don't know. If I don't know. T-shirts. Nobody or... liked that Bucky the Bull. He had two big buck teeth. <laughs> 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 Reza already said we can get a costume and Corey could wear it around. <laughs> yeah. well, we probably yeah. find somebody else. 
Are we about wrapped up? Did you get enough? I, I think we got enough. We might need version two or episode two at a later date. How old are you, Charlie? 82, 83? I'll be 82 in July, 4th okay. of July. Huh. How's Yvonne put up with you for all We've been married years? 63 years, but she couldn't speak English. I know. She's French, right? She's from France, and she didn't know what I was saying until we got married, and then <laughs> I started teaching late. her English. <laughs> <laughs> Marriage advice number <laughs> three. <Yeah. laughs> I don't think any of our wives know what we're saying when no. we get married. Or well, we I, don't know what we're saying. I do know Mrs. Decker, and she is a saint. She is if, a saint. If you, wherever the nominations are for sainthood, Give me the form because I'm <laughs> I'm putting her up for her nomination. But we're just so lucky that people like you and Bob and Bill and Dan and all those who you've mentioned, Lance Shelvin, you know, one of the guys I got to work with a lot on land exchanges was Ron Marcou. Yeah, Marcou. Yeah. Do you have time for a little Ron Marcou story? Or do you got to go? No, Ron Marcou. Uh, I got one for you. Royal Teton. That project down in Paradise Valley? Yeah. They were clients of mine in the CPA firm. And when they told me that they were going to sell, well, you know, there are all these options. And as you can imagine, everybody wanted that place. And they approached me and said, hey, you do a lot of work with the Oak Foundation. You know, you think they'd buy this joint? I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't know if they have any money. You know, it's worth a lot of money. So I call up here when you guys were still in the old old, old building. Factor building? Yeah, and I can't even remember who I got a hold of, but they put me in touch with Ron Marcoux. Marcoux. And uh, so, anyhow, I connected. I told those guys, well, call Ron Marcoux. And uh, anyhow, that deal just about fell apart 10 times, maybe 20 times. I, <laughs> I told them, if you guys do this with Elk Foundation, I, my time is free. So I got to sit on the other side of the table in that <laughs> transaction. And they called me after about nine or 10 months of this falling apart. I mean, all the other 20 groups or however many groups, because we're close to Yellowstone, everyone's going to say how it's going to be. Well, this group, they're, they're like, you know, why don't we just sell it to a private party? We, we don't have all these headaches. <laughs> and to their credit, they're like, no, no, we want to do the right thing. But they called me and they said, Randy, the board has told us to tell you that we are done, this transaction is done, unless you can convince all those other groups that Ron Marcoux is running the show on that side. And so I had to call all the, all the other groups and say, you're not in on the meetings. You, 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 <laughs> you're going to sit outside in the lobby and see what Ron Marcoux comes up with. And why? Because everything Ron Marcoux had done and said to that point he kept his word. Nothing changed. It was, this is what we're here for. This is, he is transparent and he was committed. And so that group on the other side of the table of all the people that were trying to be involved in that transaction, they picked Ron Marcoux and the Elk Foundation as the people they could trust. Hmm. I didn't that's know that. That's I didn't how know that, that deal stuff. got done. I didn't know that. They were going to pull out. If it wasn't for Ron Marcoux, that property would not be public land right now. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. See, that's something I didn't know. Yeah. I mean, you think about the Rons and the Lance Shelvins yeah. and the, you know, Don. And, I mean, the list of people who've played, you know, I, I look at Jim Zumbo. You know, he sat on the board a time or two. Yeah. And, and I just saw Jim downstairs yesterday. Yeah. And it's so nice to see him again yeah. and, and talk. We had such a wonderful visit. And, oh, he offered to be on the podcast. Too, awesome. Curry. Yeah. Jim? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you talk about a guy who really m used his platforms to make a pitch yeah. that elk hunters need to be conservationists. Yeah, Jim, with his platform at Outdoor Life, he didn't have to write those pieces and and try to sway people towards the cause of the Elk Foundation, but he did. Yeah, and so I mean, we could list off so many people, and I apologize for the ones that deserve to be mentioned in an hour and. 15 minute yeah. podcast that aren't being <laughs> mentioned but it's it's amazing stuff charlie it is it's got to put a big smile on your face is anybody going to listen to this <laughs> well we've we've had three people so far listen so. <laughs> yeah. we're hoping yeah. that maybe we could convince another one but yeah can we give them your email address no 
No. You you answer emails anymore? No, I don't do that crap. Yeah, I didn't think so. You got a Facebook page? No. no. Instagram? No. I, I see there's a a message from oh. Nancy Holland oh. looking to arrange time to get the jars to you. Oh, my wife sent her a bunch of jar, uh, jars. <laughs> oh, Everybody yeah. brings these jars back empty. My wife makes a lot of huckleberry jam and yeah, jar and, cakes and yeah. stuff and sends it all over the United States. And they give them jars back empty. Thinking that they'll get another they'll one. come yeah, back. Exactly. Full. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I just, we as we walked in there, you know, Risa said something and, and you said, well, I might not be here tomorrow and I don't think anybody would know or care or something. And I thought, you know, that that may be, but you were here 40 years ago. Yeah. And that has changed the landscape and it's changed the lives of, of people like us. I mean, I, I credit the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation for what I do today. Everything. Yeah. I mean, the, the platform that I had through being involved with the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation has created what I've been able to do. And so... You sitting in Libby, Montana, Troy, Montana, 40 years ago has impacted me. It's impacted Randy. It's impacted everyone who's listening to this podcast. And it's going to continue because of, of what you started and the vision you had. Well, I think it's, yeah, I've, we've arrived. But right. <laughs> yeah, And, you know, Charlie, I know you well enough that I know what family and friends and relationships mean to you. And that's why the Elk Foundation is has just has this family feel to it you were talking about the old logo last year in colorado my son draws a deer tag i pick him up at the airport and he is wearing an orange hat with the old rma logo <laughs> on it i'm like where in where? the heck did you get that he said well remember when i was on the committee when i was like in fourth grade he still had it <laughs> and it was and uh, so now I see the logo is coming back this summer, it looks like. But the point was, he, he, he helped on committees. It was a family thing. Last night at Volunteer Fun Night, one of our chapter members from Bozeman, Steve, is there. And his son, Ronan's with him. And that kid, I remember seeing him when he was three, four years old, selling raffle tickets. Uh, it, it's been their family thing that they do. If you need something for the Elk Foundation and you call Steve... He, he he's gonna do it, or he's gonna make his son. So, your and and Bob being the same way, you guys are about family. You're about that next generation. You see it in it, it permeates this organization probably more than than most people realize. Yeah, it. I mean, I've got thousands of stories of people who have met somebody and got married. I, people that take their vacation, they've been to a banquet together, didn't know each other, and they go home and have been best friends forever. Yeah. And the board members is the same way. I mean, they tie into somebody, a Hoxie and Tom Lewis. They do, I mean, there's yeah. relationships that have come out of this organization. And that's a, really a gratifying thing is see the relationships that people come together in the organization and they got other lives, but now they're connected and do a lot of stuff together. Yeah. And they've got, they have annual things that they, up at Lewis's, they hunt pheasants. It's got to be an annual thing, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, relationships. <clears throat> it's, uh, yeah. it's a good deal. Well, have you ever missed a board meeting? In my six years on the board, you never missed one. I've never missed one in 40. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? Even during turkey season, you didn't miss one. Nope. I've heard you say a couple times, are we done yet? Me and Gabby got to go turkey hunting. <laughs> but, no, uh, that's something that I'm, I have not missed that I know of. I was going to have them go through the records, but I can't remember ever missing a board meeting in 40 years. Yeah. Well, Charlie Decker, I'm here to tell you that you may not accept this, but someday when when the history is recorded, you're going to be one of those special people that the world remembers. Well, I appreciate that. I I think we've made a difference when you look at the numbers. So, yeah. But it's been a fun ride, and the people I've met are, that belong to this organization are the salt of the earth people. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that you started it for years ago. <laughs> oh, wow. And uh, I know you got to go to an event here. You don't you got to go to the chairman's reception or something? Yeah. yeah. Or the, it's a board reception. <laughs> 
Yeah, they, they got the chauffeur down there. Right? I, I, they've really treated me good. Usually I got a bummer ride, but <laughs> yeah. they kind of took care of me this weekend. But I've let yeah. them know. Really? They, they didn't tell you you had to dress up? You were in, <laughs> you were in sweatpants and a T-shirt and a vest. Well, I, I'm going to wear what I want to wear. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> I'm not going to a fashion show. Yeah. <laughs> Yvonne doesn't tell you, Char Charlie. Charles Decker, you cannot well, that wear that. that brings up another story. I don't want to tell you this. but I, <laughs> We got to hear it now. Yeah. I fish a lot of derbies in a uh, for rainbow, and I was going to Canada or, or hunting. It don't matter. Yeah. Uh, my wife takes the day's clothes with the date <laughs> and the day, and everything I need is in there. The socks, the shorts, everything is. Whoa! Deal. But I'll tell you the reason for that. In my early days, why I was involved in logging and stuff, why. I think it was Bacchus come to town. Uh huh. Senator, wife, Senator Mac Bacchus. Yeah, yeah. He was, she, my wife was working at the school and she wasn't there to help me get dressed. So I'm setting up on the stage and I got these dress pants and I don't look good in dress pants. Well, I got a white sock and a black sock on <laughs> and she's in the front row and I see her staring daggers at me because <laughs> my, my, my pants had come up and. Uh, <laughs> And I'm going. I'm grinning like a chessy cat, and I'm going to speak with this big shot here and all this stuff. And uh, I, uh, I uh, got home, and boy, was she hot. She said, "I told, didn't I lay socks out for you?" I said, "No, I just grabbed a couple. I didn't. It don't matter." <laughs> and so she makes sure that I don't screw up and not have the right colors or whatever on. So, uh, well. We're grateful that she's there helping yeah. you, Charlie. We, 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 we don't know. Whatever where he, she's doing, she's doing something right. Yeah, yeah. you're not the easiest guy to direct. <laughs> no. Right? You're like a great big snowball running down the hill, and she's got to try and steer yeah, where it's going to go. she's to bump me one way or the other once in a while, keep me on the straight and narrow. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for your time today, well, Charlie. Uh, thank thanks you, for guys. for everything I, you've I done. I hope it turns out for you. Uh, enjoy it. I don't... They will enjoy they it. They will indeed. I let promise me, you. Let me know if you hear any, back, any bad or death, death threats or anything. <laughs> death threats? <laughs> no, we won't hear any. Hey, we're, our, we're sorry. You better go redo your hair. Our, our, uh, oh, our, our, our big shots. And that, that's not my help. <laughs> no? All right. Well, we don't want Yvonne to get mad at you because you got well, brill, you my hair I go brill cream on one side and not on I the other. <laughs> All right. You better go, Charlie. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. Take hey, care. Girl. See ya. Oh man, what a, what an American treasure! My eh, Corey? goodness, yeah, that's uh, my first time. I mean, I've shook his hand, I've said hi, but first yeah. time getting to sit down and yeah, hear the stories from his mouth. Yeah, I I wish we could just do podcast after podcast with him and get him on a roll. You know, I, I feel so blessed that. Like he was telling the story in 93 when he sat on the Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Commission. He and I would just have some interesting <laughs> conversation. But, yeah, you know, you want another thing he'd always say is, well, you come from a logging family, so you can't be all bad. <laughs> it was like his way of forgiveness. As dumb as you are, yeah. you, you got to have good in you somewhere. <laughs> but, uh, you know, he's the one who uh, at times – uh, we we were trying to get something passed on the commission, and he said Newberg, and he always called me Newberg, you know, not Randy, and Newberg. Why don't you go back to Bozeman and get some people signed up for that, and then come back and then tell me about it? Because right now you might just be the only one. <laughs> you, you might be the squeaky wheel or something like that. So I went back. I started a rod and gun club, and we all went up to Helena. And Charlie said, "All right." So they approved this special youth season based on he. My point of that is, he's a man of his word, and he doesn't want to just talk about it and you know have meeting after meeting. It's about getting things done yeah. with Charlie, and that's well. You just look at to go through what they did, eight thousand dollars a piece in nineteen eighty three. Like you mentioned, interest rates, people yeah. were it was tough living in the early eighties. Yeah. And to put eight thousand dollars of your own personal money on the line, and then a year later only have two hundred and thirty-three members to show. Yeah, most people, myself included, would probably be like, "Okay, this wasn't a good idea. Yeah, well, let's fold let's the cards. Bear. Let's cut the losses. Let's move yeah. on." 
but he wasn't willing to to walk away from that. No, and you know, I I, I wish that Bob Munson could have been here. Bob's was active for many years. He's having back surgery, and he's not been able. He's lives in Washington. He's not been able to to come here. But uh, both of them, their their heart. You, you can't find people as. Uh, how do you say it? when you find people as committed as they are you know that there's going to be some positive outcomes and yep. i just I and the feel, reasons the reasons they did it i mean yeah you look today the reasons we myself included i think as a as a society and whole the reasons aren't there the same yeah i mean they didn't do it to make money they didn't no. do it to get recognition they no. didn't do it to grow an instagram account nope they did it to protect elk. Yep, that was it. That was and, it. And, you know, one time we were sitting at a, an event and Charlie and Bob were both there and the they kind of, they became a little bit of a traveling road show for a while. And yep. it was it was hilarious to, <laughs> to listen to the two of them because Bob knew the things to put out there to get Charlie all wound up. And Bob's more filtered than Charlie. But, uh uh, after thing, it was kind of wrapping up, and and they said something. Charlie said something really profound, and I don't know that he even really meant it to be profound. It, profound. It was just Charlie's way of communicating. He said, "Well, what we knew if we didn't do it, who was going to do it then?" Yep. You know the old same saying of "If not me, who? If not now, when?" Yep. Charlie said that almost verbatim, and he, he's like. I, I never really thought about I, I We needed more elk and I liked elk hunt. And so, I, you know, so now I think about this as I've, you know, see how we invest a lot of our time and energy on social media. People do. They, they didn't have a social media to go yeah. and complain on or point out all the flaws of someone who was trying you know, criti criticizing the, the, Can you the imagine bullet. the criticism they would have gotten oh, in their first year. Yeah. And you know, for them, it was like, well, if we got a problem, we got to go fix it. No. Yep. And that's what they did. Yep. Right? So it's, it is so remarkable. And, uh, we're, we're so lucky to have Charlie as the storyteller still. He's, yep. <laughs> he is, I, I, maybe what we got to do some days we, we bring, other people on the podcast who who know Charlie, who know Charlie. Yeah. And, and we'll get three or four of them at a time. Like he was talking about Bob Gibson. Uh, Bob lived in Bozeman. He was the forest super forest service chief on the Gallatin when the Elk Foundation in the late eighties was doing all that migration corridor work. Well, Gibby, as he was known, uh, was a fanatic elk hunter, and he was here. Here is a guy who is way up in the Forest Service. He was there volunteering. The first time I met him was when I volunteered for the committee in 1992. He didn't have to be there. No. But, man, he was whipping people into shape. Like, we need this. And so it was, it, that was just the mindset of, if we're going to solve things, we got to roll up our sleeves and get it done. Yep. And I, I guess maybe I asked the question rhetorically, but... If Facebook and Instagram and the social media were exist back then, would it just been four guys who got on their smartphones and complained about the situation? Yep. It, no, like I said, the right people at the right time. Yeah. You know, that's just, yeah. And the, the whole story and, you know, we brought up the wolf thing and he brought it up, which, mm -hmm. you know, I remember. Yeah. 19, was it 94? 90, well, that's when they released him, yeah. yeah. But I remember people up in arms that why isn't mm -hmm. the Elk Foundation taking a stand on this? This is going to impact elk populations. If they care about elk, why aren't they taking a stand? Yeah. And it was hard to defend. I right. mean, it really was. It was, you know, and I think they had a good answer. Mm -hmm. um, just, hey, we aren't a political organization. We aren't right. getting involved in politics. We're right. going to, we're on the ground. We're focused on elk. Uh, I don't think any of us saw the impact wolves were going to have. No. And once we realized, once the foundation realized that, they mm -hmm. changed. Right. It wasn't like, hey, we're going to stick with this. They realized we've got to do something. Right. This isn't about succumbing to pressure from members. This isn't. This is about. This is impacting elk, and right. we care about elk. We have to get involved. Yeah. And to the level they've gotten involved, if that is still an issue in somebody's craw, that's uh, uh, they're just looking for. Yeah, an exactly. Excuse. They're looking for yeah. an excuse not to do something. Yeah. To, 
And there's been other things. I mean, there really have. There have been, you know, the private land. Everybody said, oh, the, they get this land donated and then all the executives go and hunt there. That's, yeah. that's not true. That's rumor. That's, yeah, that's not. Rumor. And so that's I why I say, if you're not a member of the Elk Foundation, explain to me why. Yeah. I bet I have an answer <laughs> that's going to be factual. I'm not going to try to persuade you right. to, to change your mind, but there's a lot of rumors. There's a lot of misconception out there. They've admitted when they've made mistakes, mm -hmm. but the good that they've done, I don't care what mistakes they've made, where they are today and the impact that they're making to preserve and conserve elk habitat, access, all of these things. That's important to me because it's going to be important to my children and, and yeah. grandchildren. Yeah. And I, I can't tell you how many times I sat in board meetings. Uh, Charlie didn't miss any of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Charlie and Bob would, uh, you know, if there was, there, there was, I don't care. If you're, if you're going to lead an organization to its best place it can be, you got to have competing ideas yeah. among board members, among leadership. It, it, you can't be a bunch of yes people. Yep. Well, I can assure you in my six <laughs> years on the board, there were no yes people. <laughs> there was a, a lot of, it's a good thing it was closed doors. But the point that Charlie and Bob would always make is getting back to what is best for elk, elk habitat, other wildlife, and our hunting heritage. Yep. And they would say, all right, we did our vote, and I don't care if it passed 11 to 10. That's our decision, and we're all on the team. Okay? If, if you're not in on that, then, you know, maybe you shouldn't be on this team. And, you know, the, their leadership and their guidance in that of, if we tell the world that among us board members, this is what we stand for. This is what we're going to stand for. Yeah. And, and how, I mean, you look at, we hate to bring politics up, but you look at the political atmosphere right mm -hmm. now. It's not like that. No, not at it, all. It's 217 to 211, and we're still 217 people against 211 people or whatever it is. Yeah. It's, it's so divisive, and I think that that is the, just the remarkable thing they've done is they've been divided on things, but once they make a decision... Mm -hmm. They get behind it and they push as a group, as a family. That's the decision that they're going with. Whether yeah. that person voted against it or not, they get behind it and they believe in the yep. direction. Whether that one decision was in agreement with what they thought, they still have a, a hundred percent belief in the vision. Yeah, and you know, I think you look at all the if you want to call them critter groups. And if you look at, you know, every year, if you're at a habitat level, I think, or whatever, I mean, you can go to their website and look at their financial statements. They're very healthy financially. Yeah. Membership is robust. And that's not by accident. Yep. You know, people have all the choices of where they'd invest their time or their money. Hey, there's, <laughs> there's a gazillion things out there. And there's an awful lot of people who like the results they see at the Oak Foundation yep. and they're supporting them. And, and I think what, you know, I think you might have mentioned it, but it's so important to recognize there's members. There's yeah. a membership. You pay $40 a year. You are a member. Yep. There's other levels of membership, all the way up to a life member that is yep. $1,800 something. Yeah, I don't remember like the, that. the exact. But I mean, it's an investment. But yep. you and I are both life members. Mm -hmm. It, it isn't something we did when we were 21 years old, 22. Right. At a certain no. point, we thought, I'm passionate about this. I'm going to become a life member. Yep. That membership is important, whether you're a, an annual member or a life member. There are donors, yep. and those are a huge part yes. of this foundation, whether it's financial, whether it's land, those things. That contributes to mm -hmm. the success. There are volunteers, who go out in the field and do projects, who go to banquets and put on the banquets that raise more money where you raise money at these banquets. So yeah. it takes all of these pieces continually growing and moving together to make an organization like this. So it's yeah. just, you know, I started out as an annual, I bought the membership because I had to be a member to go to the elk calling contest. <laughs> okay. that, that was what got me <laughs> buying an annual membership. Yeah. And then they would lure me in with a pocket knife, yeah. you know, a pocket knife or a keychain or whatever it was they were giving out. And I'm like, oh, I'm waiting until then to go sign up. Yeah. And then as I became more involved, I got involved with banquets and then at a banquet became a life member. And so there's just, I think as we progress. And so I, my, my point of all this is, to the listeners, 
if you're not a member, please become a member. Yeah. They're, they're $40 a year. That's... That money becomes hundreds of dollars when it's used the way the Elk Foundation uses yeah. it. That's at a bare minimum what we need to be doing as elk hunters. Yep. If there's another level you can go to, great. If yep. your next level is becoming a volunteer, be a volunteer, get involved. Yep. You know, there, Like he said, there were the PACs. You get to actually be on a committee to determine where money is being spent in your, in your state. state. You aren't right. raising money in Idaho and then watching it go to South Dakota and be like, hey, well, we're struggling right. here. Right. You know, there's money that comes right back to your state. Mm-hmm. And so I, there's just... There's so much there, and I'm so passionate about not just elk, but the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation yeah. and the work that they've done, and I know what it's going to be. I know things are not going to get better on the hunting atmosphere over the next 10 years. Right. Yeah. It's going to get worse. We're going to be attacked. Access is going to be attacked. Hunting yeah. rights are going to be attacked. Number of animals, management of animals, politics are going to attack science. Mm-hmm. And we have to have an organization like this that is robust now that's going to be able to protect that. Yeah. Couldn't have said it better. That's, that's, that's a great sales pitch, Corey. Well, but it's, it's not, not a sales, a sales pitch. pitch. It's, it's, it's what I fact. believe in. Yeah. yeah. I, no, I don't get, I, I'm not a spokesman. I mean, I am because I want to be. Right. But it's, uh, it's something I believe in. No. And I, you know, 40 years from now. I hope that the Elk Foundation is way bigger. Yeah. I hope that the, if you want to call it scorecard of what they've accomplished and, you know, acres of habitat conserved, acres of public access improved or created, I hope those numbers are XX more. Yep. And they will if people if. <laughs> do just what you said, you know, yep. become a member or volunteer or donate or whatever you can do. Up. And uh, the elk and the future generations of elk hunters will be a lot better off because of it. And that's why we do what we do. Yeah. Yeah. We're lucky. Yeah. Uh, I don't think a day goes by where we don't count our blessings. And uh, having guys like Charlie is just a reminder to me that, and I always say this someone did something along the way that was difficult, challenging, and could have walked away. Yeah that has made my life and my ability to go and hunt and do and, and enjoy. Well, there's Charlie Decker's, Bob Munson's, there's thousands of people back along that trail I've traveled who did those kind of things. And this Elk Foundation and Charlie and Bob and the, the other guys are an example of that when I say, someone did this so that I can enjoy what I do today and that gives me this sense of obligation that yeah. I got to do it, if not for myself, for that next generation. Yeah. I was thinking about that, you know, just that I feel like I am, uh, I'm at a point where I am taking a torch and carrying it forward. Mm-hmm. But yeah. I'm not the one that started it. No. Not Those at all. guys start, it's easy to grab a torch and to run forward with it. Yeah. It's not easy to light that torch and pick it up and, and start moving it with it. Yeah. Yeah. And so you look at, you know, in this case, the Charlie, the Bob, yeah. Bill, Dan, I'm passionate about elk calling. Mm-hmm. I look at the Larry D. Jones, the Wayne right. Carlton, mm-hmm. the Will Primos, yeah. the guys who, who picked it up, who started, you know, they didn't start elk hunting. They didn't start archery hunting. They started elk calling mm-hmm. and made it what it is today. They're the guys that you know, we're in, involved in that. And mm-hmm. so I look at that and those are the guys that they started from nothing. Yeah. I'm, I'm just coming and buying a call off the shelf and using it. My job's easy. Yeah. They started that. And mm-hmm. so you look at something like Charlie and that's what's so amazing to me is they're in a tiny little town in Northwest Montana. The world, <laughs> the, there's, there's a whole world out there that they don't even know about. No reason to know about it. Yeah. yeah. And he had a vision on one herd of elk and one subdivision yep. that as a logger, he's looking at it going, well, if they buy that and privatize that land and they put up fences, those elk aren't going to be able to get through. Mm-hmm. And if they can't get through, they're going to go winter somewhere else and we aren't going to have an elk herd that comes back here in the summer. Yep. That's- and it's changed the entire landscape of elk and elk hunting, not just in Northwest Montana, but in 50 states yeah. and beyond. Yeah. And anyone who thinks, oh, I can't make a difference or no one will listen to me. 
Well, those guys are a testament that four people dedicated and committed to a cause can make a world of difference. It's I, I, I try to envision my life and how much hunting and elk hunting means to me if Charlie and Bob and Bill and Dan hadn't got this crazy idea 40 years ago. Yeah. Carve that away from your mindset today. There's, there, there's probably not even half as many elk on the landscape. There's no elk east of the Mississippi. All of these land exchanges that I've been just by coincidence and happenstance a part of, that's all now still private land. I, it, it just puts fear in my mind of yeah. how that life would look for me. Yeah. Elk hunting is tough right now. I mean, there's no doubt. There's competition. There's a lot That's, of hunters on the landscape. Right. You know, there's wolves. There's all these things we're dealing with. That it's really easy to look at elk hunting and be like, what's the point? It's hard. Yeah. Why, why would I even want to do that? Is it wait? It's a waste of my time. It's a waste of my money. Think what it would be like without the access we have, with the access that we have reduced by 1.3 million acres yeah. with land. I mean, the habitat improvement decreased by over 10 million yeah. acres. Yeah by the numbers of elk that are out on the landscape decreased by, let's just take it back to where it was when they started, yeah. half. Exactly, yeah. But I guarantee you wolves would have still been here. Mm -hmm. And if there wasn't a foundation involved to help get them delisted and all of that, yeah. the elk population wouldn't be here. Like it, that's, it's just, way less. It, yeah. we, we have what we have because four guys had a vision. Yeah. And we owe a lot to that. Yeah. And I guess anyone thinking that it doesn't matter, it matters. It matters. And that's, I Whether know. you are lighting the torch or you're just picking it up and running with it and somebody else has lit it, do something. That's a great analogy. I've never thought about that metaphor. I, I got I to gotta use that more. Yeah. I'll steal that from you. Yeah. But, well, Corey, thanks so much. Yeah, thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. And uh, nice that we actually get to do this. Yeah, in person. Yeah. That's the first one we've done in person for our, a while. Our calendars have been so crazy. I apologize for that. I've been the problem. I've yeah. been traveling so much. But, uh, Busy time. Anyhow, folks, thanks for being here. I hope you enjoyed this as much as Corey and I did. Yep. Charlie Decker is a national treasure. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't, couldn't agree more. Take care, folks.